Uh, first up, we have Edwina from uh, Diamond Dozen PR Agency. With a focus on storytelling, strategy, and public engagement, she's the perfect person to start our marketing talk off with a bang. So please, please put your hands together and welcome Edwina. Okay, so it's a bit nerve-wracking. Um, and I actually went old school and brought some slides and now I've got a mic, I don't know how I'm going to manage that. But I'll figure it out. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for inviting me, Redbubble and Toby, who's not here. Um, I'm not sure how to work this, so I think I'll just do this. Okay, so my um, company is Diamond Dozen PR, our marketing and PR. I set up, is that okay volume-wise, guys? Sorry, I'm not yelling into it. Hold it up closer. Um, I set up the agency seven and a half years ago, so start of 2008. Um, we've worked with these brands and a few more since I did that, um, if you can read that. Um, we specialise in brands, fashion brands, lifestyle, streetwear. Um, lately we've been doing hospitality, alcohol, a whole bunch of different things. Um, and I guess I wanted to tell you why am I why am I qualified to speak to you? But basically I work with creatives all the time. So a whole list there, I include like skateboarders and surfers as creatives, but we commi I've commissioned like illustrators, I've commissioned artists for events, um, videographers, photographers, like basically pretty much everyone. Um, I've worked with galleries. Um, so I feel like I understand creatives pretty well and a lot of my friends are artists and creatives. So I've today tried to design something a presentation that you got that's like helpful for you guys or that's specific to independent creatives to help you build your audience and hopefully you can take some of the info away and put it to use. So, first up. Um, oh yeah, so basically I've also like kind of broken down a bit of a strategy into tools and things, so I'll go through it all with you. Um, but first up, who's your audience? Um, as an independent creative, I think you have three audiences. Customers, so they're the ones that buy your products if you're selling, like on Redbubble. Um, stockists, you know, who your wholesale sales and commercial clients, commissions, collaborations, etc. Um, what do you want to communicate to your audience? So for all of them, you want to communicate your work, obviously, in some of these categories here, and your brand too. Like, what do you stand for? What's your inspiration? And why are you different to all the other creatives that are out there? Um, <coughs> tools. <coughs> to, sorry. <coughs> Tools to help you build an audience. I've just kind of broken it down into these categories and they're pretty much the same for everyone. Um, social media, everyone knows, having a good website, um, market stalls, pop-up shops, or in the case of stockists, trade shows. Um, direct mail, so if in the case of customers, that's your online sales and packages going to your customer. Um, collaborations, publicity, I'll skip through that. So social media, I'm not gonna harp on about this because everyone knows how good it is um, for me personally, it's been great. Like since I started putting some effort into Instagram about two years ago, we've picked up a heap of clients through it and people just kind of, I don't know, follow and they say, oh yeah, I saw what you've been up to, blah, blah, blah. So I can personally say it's worked for me, like in my business and I could be doing a lot better. So I'll admit that. <laughs> um, and here's some resources here. So there's some good tutorials on Redbubble um, about social media. Um, Icona Square I personally use. I don't know how many people here use, have used that. Anyone? No? Um, it gives you statistics for Instagram. So it's free. You can log on and you can see follows, unfollows. So you have a thick skin there. Um, but you can also see like your engagement, best times of the day to post. So if you want to get really nerdy about your Instagram, jump on that. Um, social media examiner, like if you want to get another level of nerdy. You can get on there and whenever there's a change to Facebook advertising or Instagram or whatever, they break it down really easily for you. So if you want to get into the nitty gritties, jump on there. And then I came across this Arts Law um, link, which I haven't read yet, but it looked pretty good, so it might be good for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, does anyone know why I have Kevin Costner on here? Yeah, that's right. Um, website goes without saying, like it doesn't have to be an expensive website, but I think these days it needs to look awesome. So Cargo Collective, um, oh yeah, Squarespace, uh, Redbubble, all those types of things. Um, but just make it look cool, make it professional, make your, co your contact info easy to use. And anyone know what that still is? Yeah, that's sneaky. Yes. And 
There's no reason I had it, but I just couldn't find an interesting picture that wasn't cheesy to put here of a <laughs> website. Um, market stores, pop-up shops, you guys probably know better than me. Like, especially in Melbourne, there's, there's some really amazing um, markets around and trade shows that you can go to that have a huge audience, huge foot traffic. Um, they can be expensive, I guess, but I think they're really worthwhile. One of my clients just um, had a stall at some space, I think at um, South Melbourne Market, and she used that to move old stock. And she's been super, super effective. She did it for about four weeks. So something to think about maybe. Has anyone actually um, had a stall at any of these trade shows or market stalls? Yeah. Did you find it good? Yeah. You're at Supergraph, weren't you? Yeah. 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 See, Kitty knows what's up. <laughs> um, direct mail. So I think like any, any time you are sending something to anyone, it's direct mail um, and it's your chance to impress them um, and to build a relationship, I guess. So, you know, I understand you're not Mr. P you may not be Mr. Porter or Ralph Lauren, like those boxes will probably cost you 50 to $80, but you can scale it down and, you know, being a creative, that's your area of expertise, like a personal, personal touch, a bit of tissue paper and a handwritten note, like goes a long way. Um, <coughs> collaborations. Um, I'm missing my notes here. Sorry, guys. Um, collabs are a cool way for creatives to just work together, like work with your friends, cross-promote each other's work. Um, you can sell it as a limited edition, just get people talking, put it on Facebook. Um, and, you know, if it's really good, you could get some publicity around it maybe. Um, has anyone done a collaboration or thought about doing a collaboration? Yeah, was it good for you? Yeah. Um, we did this, so my agency just did a small collaboration last year with um, Ladies of Leisure Zine in Melbourne and a small streetwear label, um, No Fun Babe. That's some press photos on the right. We just did 50 t-shirts um, and it was something small, it was fun and we, we got a bunch of press, like it helps obviously <laughs> we're a PR agency, but it was just a really, it was fun and it, we got a lot of social media, I guess people sharing it and you know, it was, it's something that you can do that's really within that you can do on a small budget. And then publicity here, like in my opinion, you know, publicity is something you need to earn. It doesn't just happen. Like media don't just write about you because you send them a press release. So I think this is for when you're a little bit more established or maybe you've got a, um, a store or an event or something like that. But I just wanted to include it because, well, it would be weird if I didn't, <laughs> given that I've got a PR agency. But in my experience, um, media prefer to cover events, collaborations, interviews, giveaways and product placements and that's a way that you can approach media that I think they'll be pretty receptive to. Just make sure that you have really great photos, that you're really clear with what you want, you don't ramble um, and there's some other information here that might be interesting. Relationships. So this is one that I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about. I think if you have an audience, whether you like it or not, you have a relationship. So if you've got three audiences, you have three relationships. And one thing that I've definitely found in my career, when people, creatives or events or whoever are contacting me or a brand for sponsorship or money or to do something, they often forget in their proposal to think about what's in it for the other person. So. You know, it's all about, I'm so great and my work's awesome or this event's incredible and you should sponsor it because, but what's in it for the brand? What's in it for the person that you're asking for money from or for time from? Um, so I think just even for your customers, like why, why should they shop from your Redbubble store or why, why should they follow you on Instagram? What are you giving them back? Um, it's sort of, a, it's a two-way street, I think, and I think it's something important to think about. Um, and that's why I've got some dodgy pictures here. But <laughs> uh, let me just see what else I had on this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, so one, one, I guess, idea I had, if you're stocking in a retail store, maybe you could say to the store, hey, guys, like, you know, my product's selling well. Why don't I'll offer to do your window? Like if you, get, you pay for materials, I'll do your window and I'll have some of my products in there. Um, just kind of think about like what are things they might need that you could offer in lieu of money perhaps that will help both of you or promote both of you and, and that's a good way to build relationships with commercial clients or customers or whoever. Who agrees? Anyone? Yeah? 
Um, <clears throat> values and brand, like I think it's really important. <laughs> I just didn't want to put boring pictures in here. Um, when I think for, as a creative, like it's your, this is very personal, it's you guys, it's your work, it's your personality. So I think it's important every now and then just to write down and think about what are your values, what's your brand, who, which like companies out there, which stores align with that and who could you maybe approach or talk to that will help build on that and, and I guess communicate who you are or who you want to be. Um, maintaining relationships with commercial clients and also retail stores. Um, <clears throat> meet your deadlines, you know, I mean, it's, I feel like, like I'm a lecturing, sorry, but, you know, just be, be awesome, you know, be reliable, follow through on what you said, deliver when you said you're going to, um, make sure it's high quality, um, and, and one thing to protect yourselves as well, set really clear expectations, like, so when, you know, whether it's on email or in your quote or in a contract, have, you know, what exactly, like a quick overview, exactly what what they want, exactly how much you're getting paid, like when, when your deadlines are, what the person's getting, so that if you're ever questioned or a client questions you, you can say, hey, no, no, we work this out, see, it's on email, because people forget. So that's just some advice. Um, oh, yeah, and, and the other one, like, just check in with people every now and then. You know, there's, like, Nicole, I get a postcard from Nicole, and I love it, like a little postcard set. And creatives I work with and the ones that get a lot of work are the ones that put a little bit of extra effort into staying in touch with people and just sending a handwritten note every now and then. <coughs> um, I think, you know, if you get to the point where you're questioning whether you're selling out, it's a good, it's a, that's awesome. It means you're doing a lot of work. Um, and I know that it can be an issue for some people, especially with the internet. Like if they get a bit of momentum, people want to contact them and do all sorts of work and they get concerned about selling out, hashtagging, <coughs> at tagging, whatever. Just have good people around you and trust your gut and go back to your, your values that you wrote down and what you stand for as a brand because everyone needs to get paid, especially creatives. And then, <laughs> that's the last one. But I did want to say that I think it's a really amazing time to be an independent creative. You know, sure that there's a lot of, a lot of noise out there, there's a lot of people that you're competing with, but the internet means that companies and brands need content and then they're engaging people to do installations at events or, um, or photos for their Instagram or videos for their website and there's a lot of opportunity. You just maybe sometimes need to be creative and proactive in pitching it to people. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Next speaker is Dominic. Uh, he's not only the brand implementer supervisor for Redbubble, but also an artist in his own right. His previous role at Redbubble was artist support supervisor, allowing him to help artists, himself included, market, the, market themselves in the most efficient way. Um, he brings a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the art, um, artist side of marketing. So please welcome Dom. I'm gonna start with a joke. It's not in the slides, so Toby's probably really glad that she's not here. So today I thought it was the right day to go to the dentist, you know, because as you do, you need to clean your teeth. And I hadn't been in over a year and a half. Whoops. Um, and normally I'm really fastidious about my teeth. There's some people that work with me sitting in the audience, so they know that I'm very serious about my teeth. So a year and a half is a big deal. Obviously, you know, I got my comeuppance and I had a hole, so this side of my face has been numb for pretty much the whole day. So if I start drooling, I apologise. <laughs> I'll make sure it's not on the microphone. So, anyway. Oh no, that's my bio. I don't want to read about myself again. I said good morning. Okay, good morning all. That's right. Thanks for braving the horrible weather. I know it's terrible. I hate the cold. Um, and thank you to the sponsors, RB, and for the speakers, um, Edwina, how do I top what you just did? <laughs> I'll give it a crack. Um, I guess something that, that's unique about me is that not only do I work for Redbubble, but I'm an artist myself. I was an artist before I started at Redbubble. I'm going to be an artist after I leave Redbubble, whenever that is. Um, so. 
I don't have as much experience or knowledge as someone like Edwina, but I know how it means to me as an artist and can put it into practice. So I'm just going to run through what it means to me to market to my audience and what's worked and what's definitely not worked. <laughs> so first up, my name's Dominic. Um, call me whatever you want. I don't really care. Whatever sticks will work for me. Um, I purposefully made this first slide rather naff because it's, it's important to cut through all the, the BS. Um, especially when it comes to marketing at times. So I'm a real person, so are all of you, I assume, and it's important not to <laughs> lose sight of that, especially in the world of marketing. In fact, if you only take one thing away from my quick little talk is I hope that you please remember that your story and who you are is your biggest commodity and point of difference. So your work totally falls into that as well. So all that, in my opinion, is storytelling and it's in some form or another a story, so there I am. I'm geeky, I'm uncool, I'm wearing high heels on one of those photos. Feel free to giggle, but I know you all have funny, embarrassing photos too, so I'll stalk you all later. <laughs> so, to business. Here are a couple of quotes from some well-known people on the topic, topic of marketing. I like getting to pick and choose quotes from people based on whether I actually understand what they say or not, because it makes me sound more intelligent. So, quote, in marketing, I've seen only one strategy that can't miss, and that is to market to your best customers first, your best prospects second, and then the rest of the world last. So, John Romero, for those who don't know, is an American director, designer, programmer, and developer in the video game industry. Doom might ring a bell to some of you. I'm sure Mel and Andrew have heard of him. <laughs> the tricky thing with this is knowing who is your best, who is your best customer. It's not an easy question to answer. Um, and the topic of these talks is how best to market to your audience. And I wanted to at least touch upon the fact that the first thing in figuring out how best to market to them is to know who your audience is in the first place. I know that sounds kind of basic, but it's a good question to ask. Second, second quote, the aim of marketing is to know and understand the customer so well that the product or service fits him and sells itself. So Peter Dracker was a very successful and published management consultant, consultant, educator and author. Someone worth having a look at if you're seriously interested into business management and theory. The reason I included this second quote is because it's a logical next step in once understanding the customer and audience. If you've made all the right calls and have an effective marketing strategy, the product, which is you, referring back, you are the product, it's all about you, it should work and sell for itself. So it's not all the whiz-bang games or strategies itself, it's really about you. In essence, marketing is only the presentation, nothing is more convincing than you, your work, and the story you are telling. So. This is my approach. This is a tool, a very crude tool, I use when planning a marketing strategy or event. I do not follow this as gospel, and this is just to you know, give you some visuals of how my brain works, but it is definitely a helpful matrix that I built and certainly helps guide me on what tools would be best for the audience I'm trying to reach. So those tools are on the left there. It is easy to take for granted and think it is common knowledge or simple, but I couldn't disagree more. Marketing doesn't need to be rocket science, and if you can find a way that works for you and translates for you, do it. And this is my way. Just quickly, one of my favourite quotes is, is insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. <coughs> I do that all the time, but as l at least I know that I'm insane, so that's a good start. <laughs> So later I will show you four different projects that I'm trying to, that I'm currently working on, three on Redbubble and one on Etsy. And you can imagine how each has a very different audience, yet there is always some overlap, but they all need to be targeted in different ways. So that's the voice and tone, that's where the audience lives, their habits, even just the shelf life of a fad. You know, one thing might be hot right now and then it's not. You've got to have that serious conversation with yourself. So before I do that, I wanted to focus on the matrix. In the centre is me, obviously. This represents my world, me, what I currently have at my disposal. I am a poor man. So all I've really got is this toolkit, really, on the left. Important to note that it isn't everything. Obviously, you're going to add and subtract, and you're not going to use all of those tools all at once. But that's my current arsenal. The second layer, that's my immediate, already acquired audience. 
So now these guys and girls may have the same or similar tools to me as well. It's a pretty safe bet. I would have reached them out through one of these tools. So it's a great way to spread the word and have what I consider a successful marketing strategy is whether I can penetrate and increase that second layer. I can't afford a team of people like Redbubble does who work for me and spend money on hardcore acquisition campaigns maybe one day, but in the meantime, this is what I have to work with, just me. So my priority at the moment is can I get them, that second layer, to use the tools that they have at their disposal to market for me? So more simply, that ripple on effect in order to just grow my first layer of audience. Again, it's important to note different pathways and areas to focus may be used for different initiatives. One way will not always work for the other. It's not a guarantee. And then my third layer. So these are the people I do not currently have, but I clearly want to acquire. So I want them to be loyal and interested and then hopefully engage with me. That is the money part, if anyone was wondering. Um, they all have tools and social networks as well, and here comes the ripple. I think you know where this all goes. It isn't really rocket science, of course. And it's probably quite familiar to most of you, but for me, when I'm starting down with a piece of paper, how do I want to sell this new design or this new product? I just go back to the basics. This is my current audience. I know this much about them. What's their audience? How do I get to them? Is there certain people that I should be focusing on? So there's my little secret. So to put, into, put it into practice, so for example, I may have a new design I want to share with people. In my research, I may have identified that the people who are most likely going to enjoy and possibly buy this work are heavy Facebook users. It's just an example. So user one might be a heavy Facebook user, has lots of friends, loves art and design, loves to support me and to share posts to their page. Majority of the stuff they share is politically themed. Cool. The other user, user two, not as a regular Facebook user as the first, posts only occasionally, but when they do, they are always really interesting and diverse posts, often about something creative that gets a lot of engagement from their friends. So which one do I target and spend most of my time focusing on? Well, the short answer is the second for sure, but why not both? So a really smart person would make sure they can get to both and engage their audience, but even smarter should know to really target the second, track the second, engage the second. I'm speaking too long. So I'm going to go straight to my Etsy store. So to give you some insight, here is my Etsy store. It's called Weave It Designs. I make hand-woven bracelets with an array of colours. I want to make it quite clear, I make absolutely no money with Weave It. It's at a loss completely, 100%, but it's totally my testing ground and it's what I do when I'm watching Game of Thrones at home in front of the TV. <laughs> so in one week I decided to do this, this Etsy store. I'd never been on Etsy before, so in a week I taught myself everything there was that I could about Etsy. I learnt how to do the finger weaving, I picked colours, I took photos, my own. I set up the Facebook page, did all, it all by myself. Rough, it's obviously not perfect, but I just gave myself a week to give it a crack. In that first week, I did a series of different promotions to try and generate some buzz. So I did a what the F is that competition on Instagram. So I'd take, up a, take a close up shot of something really strange and then get people to guess what it is. Post, share it, whoever won got a free weave it. Um, second, I did countdowns, so every time I got a milestone, I would post and I'd share that and I'd try and share that story with my audience and get them excited about my success. I did customer picks. Someone in the audience might recognise someone here. Um, so every time someone made a purchase, and this goes back to what Edwina was saying, every time someone made a purchase, I would take a photo of me with their order in a beautiful envelope and a date and a stamp and I'd hold it in my mouth and take a selfie and send it off when it shipped and then I'd ask them to post a, a picture of themselves back once they bought it. I did products designed based on a specific audience, so anyone know what BJJ is? So Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I don't do it, look at me, but I know quite a few people that do, so I thought I would try and create a product that's aimed specifically at BJJ people. I don't know of many people that wear bracelets or around that BJJ audience, but it clearly went really well and it's now my top selling product. So like I said, the main reason I keep this doomed to fail business alive is because, which by the way, I had no idea, I didn't start it knowing. 
I honestly thought I could get rich off watching Game of Thrones and finger weaving for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> it is just now my testing ground. So I don't really care what happens. I just want to, want to use it as a way to trial new ideas. That's all it's ever going to be for me. It's not costing me all that much money. I've already made back all my money. I'm just losing a hell of a lot of time. <laughs> so to Redbubble. So I work for Redbubble, but I'm also an artist on Redbubble, and I've got three separate shops on Redbubble for three separate types of work. So Left of Meridian is my main, my main artistic endeavour. It's what I'm currently putting all my work into. My old stuff from when I was in high school, and I had like lots of boyfriends and girlfriends, and love was important to me, and I thought I was amazing. <laughs> People love it. <laughs> and then... My last one, which is my latest, is called Quotron, which is just all total, I'm selling out and I'm knowing it, <laughs> but it is all just customised stuff. So if people want to buy something and they want their name on it, I'm going to offer it. And secretly, Redbubble doesn't like it if you do that, but shh, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> so this is Left of Meridian. That's me on Facebook. That's my website up in the left. That's my Twitter and then that's my business card as well if you want one. Feel free to come and check it out. Um, everything that I've learned from Weave It, I'm trying to now do with Left of Meridian, but in a much more intense way. So instead of just doing it all in once in a week, which by the way, you know, it really helped. I got like 400 followers and quite a lot of sales, but I'm just taking one aspect, one initiative at a time. So this was the latest competition that I did for Left of Meridian. It was a three day giveaway. Um, I didn't make any sales. It's fine, um, but I did it on Facebook and Instagram and I learned that Facebook is the worst place to have a competition. People just aren't interested. They're sick of being spammed. Instagram's the best place to do a competition. I just taught myself something. Easy, easy win. And probably the biggest success out of all of this is that um, when I picked the winners, the third winner was my cousin and she's 16 and she's really cool and she doesn't think I'm cool. But she won the third one and now she's telling all of her friends at school about the, the pouch that she's got and now they all want to buy one. So, you know, who knows? It might go somewhere. But it's all just testing. I'm constantly testing, failing, trying again. So where to next? I've got a rush. Anna's going to kill me. I'm always going to keep testing. I'm really focusing on knowing my audience. I'm definitely not afraid to fail. Um, not all social media works. That insanity quote, don't keep doing things over and over again if it doesn't work. Um, and consistency is key. And the last thing that I'm going to quickly mention is that I kind of want to be where Edwina wants to be at some stage and at my own agency. So the next thing I'm working on is, and please don't be offended, is <laughs> represent this. <laughs> so I'm a producer and I, and I help a lot of artists kickstart their careers on places like Redbubble and stuff, so I'm hoping to set up my own business based around that. I'm sorry, Anna, I'm over, I'm finished. Do you want me to introduce Mel? Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Dom. Um, our next speaker uh, is Melanie, uh, who is a Melbourne-based digital designer specializing in installations and fantastic side projects. She works in the digital world wh where she merges UX design and play. Check out our latest project, which is the game she designed with her partner on the left. So have a play at the end after the talk. Uh, please put your hands together and welcome Mel. I guess I'll start with, it's honestly weird seeing artists next to my name on a screen. Um, for most of my professional life and personal life, I guess, I've hidden behind the title of designer. Um, design something almost, well, I guess, universally is understood. People understand the word, that it's a profession of, of logos, of visuals, of colours, of drawing. Um, I guess commercial creativity is what you would call it. Um, I remember one morning in particular, uh, I was with my little sister and, about, and she was about to start primary school for the first time and rocked off at this classroom with my mum my little sister and she was really excited and my mum points up at a, a wall um, at this artwork by a previous prep and says, hey, look, that's what your older sister does for a living. And um, for clarity, finger painting is not what I do for a living. Um, 
During the weekdays, I guess, I'm called a digital designer. Um, technology and digital is almost understood fundamentally by everyone, like design. It's a centrality to our modern lives, so, you know, a smartphone receives calls and sends messages and accesses the internet. So, when people ask me, what, what do you do as a job or what, what is a digital designer, my common response to avoid, I guess, ambiguity is, well, I make websites and apps, I guess, um, which, is, which is partly true. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you today about like a, dish, a different kind of side of myself, I guess, or a different kind of design or digital that I envision for the future. Um, I envision a future for a digital marketplace ruled by makers and creators and most importantly inventors. And now more than ever, I guess the lines are being blurred between what is art, what is design, what is digital, who cares? Like, <laughs> and what does that mean for digital marketing and how does it fit? So, there was never a doubt in my mind that I would be a creative of some sort. Um, the objective was to do what I loved, not what was expected of me, or my wallet, I guess. Um, in high school, I wanted to get into advertising, big bad word of advertising, with dreams of working for companies like Coca-Cola and McDonald's. This is my dream, companies like, I w I've made it if I've got there. Um, I did everything in my power um, to get into a course at the Academy of Design, and there I found a group of friends and staff willing to listen and collaborate and experiment and I was like, yeah, I'm set. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a huge internship with a giant agency and work my way all the way up to the top. That was my plan. That was until one eye-opening moment. Um, I was sitting in the auditorium of Creative Conference, doodling away in my notebook like I thought every good designer should do. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was having a great time. Um, doodling about typography, graphic design, branding, cool, yeah, awesome. And I thought, oh, every good creative has to appreciate this. I'm like listening intently, trying to find the nugget of information and how I'm going to like succeed and win millions of dollars. Um, and then on stage came two guys, um, Steve and Nimrod from NS here in Melbourne and their work, The Light Garden. It completely like caught me off guard. Like, it was like the moment that changed everything for me. I'd never seen anything like it before. Um, Light Garden is an interactive garden. It's a 3D structure, projection mapping, extravaganza of trees and ponds and goldfish and butterflies and all sorts of things. And they had recreated something so tangible and so ingrained in our minds as a physical outdoor experience, indoors as a digital experience. And the, ideas, the idea that like, s surfaces could be sensitive, like they could feel things, and that things that are made out of technology could completely challenge your thoughts blew me to absolute pieces. I was like, I don't know what I'm even doing. Um, now, the time like smartphones and proper web interactivity was like just bursting onto the scene. So this is like predating like internet in our pockets essentially. And these guys were doing like crazy projection things. Um, and this is the moment I reevaluated all that I knew as an artist, a creative or whatever. Um, and I thought, you know, advertising a television ads and billboards and it's great, cool. Um, but it changed it to what I hoped and dreamed the future could look like. For me, these guys were infinitely more marketable than anyone I'd ever seen at a conference before because they weren't followers but passionate leaders of their field. And they were shaping and creating their own titles, experiences and marketplaces. Another guy that's awesome, um, John Lasseter from Pixar. He's the chief creative officer at Pixar, responsible for movies like Toy Story and Finding Nemo. And he championed computer animation in a time where hand-drawn animation was the only thing. Uh, and he was a really good hand an animator, by the way, hand-drawn animator, by the way. Um, for the first time, the computer animated film was interesting to people and entertained people, not because of the mere fact it was made by a computer, but because of the stories and characters. And I think digital is experiencing the same shift. 
Um, what can we do as artists and creatives to extend past our mediums or specific tools and outputs into a more universal space? So speaking about more human topics. For me, what I've finally come to realise my own marketability is attributes to my personal work. Um, when I was free to begin with concepts and ideas with no determined output, a website or device, a mobile app, um, I was free to explore with technology and just simply explore. So for me, you are your own market, really. Uh, Isaac, this is Isaac, made Isaac, um, is a study on the act of seeing. Uh, he was born when I was asked to participate in an interactive art show and I thought, well, what if the artwork could look back at you? Essentially, it's a projection map styrofoam ball on sticks. Yeah. <laughs> Um, made in a program called Touch Designer that followed people as they passed by so it could track human beings with a webcam. Um, I watched at the gallery as people were getting really uncomfortable with the art. They were kind of like, why is this thing in a gallery, first of all? And why is it following me around, I guess? Uh, and I realised people have like this innate predisposition to behave when they're being watched. Like, they're kind of like, oh, it's can see me, I'm just going to stop doing whatever I was doing. Um, so, when I took one step further back from the artwork, I guess, um, I thought, well, how could this apply to something like security cameras, right? Um, but I realised if I started with redesigning security cameras, I could only get another security camera. Um, and so, by zooming out and focus on the concept, concept of seeing or being watched, um, I think we were able to just simply explore the concept. I had no idea that I could do anything like this, by the way, when I had the idea to do something like this, um, with something like this. Looks really technical, but actually really easy to pick up. Um, but that's the wonder of technology. It's, you can just jump in and just see how it goes, really. I was then one day um, looking at commuters on the train. Everyone was like not talking. I was like, everyone could be friends on this train. But everyone's like plastered onto their phones, like really busy doing whatever they're doing. And I wondered like, when would we begin to form relationships with our phone, like proper relationships? And what our world would look like or what we would become once we started forming relationships with inanimate objects. So I created Rock With A Heart. It's a pet rock. Um, you can pet it, you can touch it, you can have a beer with it, you can punch it if you want. But the more physical contact and experiences you have with the pet rock awarded you with more friendship points. So you're building this relationship with the plastic thing with sensors and electronics in it. Fast forward to a year ago when I became interested in the process of digital design. So I was looking around me like, what the hell's going on? Too often the internet is simply a collection of the same styles. So whatever the interface trend at the time is, and then what's the next trend, and we'll just do that. Um, but what if we considered every single pixel we ever laid down on the screen for every single website? Would the internet function and look like a much different place? So I threw myself in the deep end and decided to learn the art of pixel art, laying down every pixel at a time, which is really tedious when you're used to like drawing out rectangles and stuff in Photoshop. Uh, and I began to create an arcade game with Andrew Buntine over there, um, who's a newly titled games developer, and fortunately enough for my boyfriend. So it's really great when you're a designer and you have a developer boyfriend. It's really easy to work together and do stuff. Um, Swerve and Mervyn. Yeah. It's no Sonic the Hedgehog, by the way. Um, Swerve and Mervyn is <laughs> a Melbourne-inspired pseudo 3D racing game that emulated the form of pixel art and function of old arcade games. Encased in a homemade arcade cabinet, which you can see there, very homemade. Woohoo! Um, we wanted to keep the experience as authentic as possible, so we were emulating how arcades, arcade games used to be made, like racing games used to be made, and before you know all this 3D stuff. And yeah, there's also Super Nintendo games on there if you want to play something other than Swerve and Mervyn, but you should play Swerve and Mervyn because it's fun. Um, <laughs> uh, although all seemingly disconnect, like, I know this is like, when I talk to people about this stuff, they're like, you're really weird. Um, 
although all seemingly disconnect, I don't think I could have become the digital designer I am today or really a digital designer at all without the digital experiments I do in my spare time. So I think that's really, really important. To get people to stop and think and challenge what they know in an arena of digital that's always in a constant state of flux and is always changing um, is so powerful. And I think we should never stop experimenting, sharing and trying. Other stuff I love. Uh, this is a study by Berg London called Immaterials. It's a study into things we can't see. So they pretty much had a four metre long rod with 80 points of light that they um, dragged across the city of London to reveal the cross sections of Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, so if you see all these like these things, that's the level of connectivity at every point throughout the city through an alleyway. Um, they have a whole video, you should watch it, it's really, really good. Um, part art, part design, part research, part electronics, part photography, part videography. Uh, the concept of realising visuals to represent such an invisible yet living organism that we all accept in our lives is so, I guess, informative but poetic. Uh, next one. Bright Hearts by George Crute. I don't know how to say his name, sorry. Um, in collaboration with paediatrician Dr Andrew Morrow is a relaxation app used for children undergoing painful procedures. Using real-time visualisations, the app is used to manage pain and anxiety. Through assisting the children to control things like their heart rate, they're not only able to unlock different visualisations, but they're also, they also gain a more mental awareness and control over their body and actions. Passage by Jason Rohr. Uh, is an experimental game five minutes long where you experience the entire character's lifetime. So the character dies with you. It's like really, really intense. Um, it translates the act of growing up and dying in a medium that had never seen that amount of poignancy or reflection and started getting people to reflect on video games as art, which, which they are, yeah. Um, what made these projects exceptional and memorable is not through what medium and technology they chose to explore within, but the ideas can stand alone in their commentary and concept, getting us to, I guess, view our worlds a little bit differently. New generations are growing up with selfies and social media and wide access to knowledge and limitless connection to the entire world and a lack of privacy. There's never been a greater need for engagement with technology and with the role technology plays in society and in our future. Technologi technological literacy is on the rise. Kids are getting taught to code these days. It's awesome. And as artists and makers, we need to think about what that means for the market around us, not how it can be marketable. So it's not getting better at the... Well, I found it's not really getting better at the digital tools or outputs we know, and it's not about doing things we do online at the moment. It's about wider discussions about human need. Because at the core of everything beyond any individual technology's lifespan are human beings. Thank you. And our last speaker, um, John, also known as Scooter, is not only a beer lover, but also a guerrilla marketing guru turned corporate. Uh, over the course of his career, he has taken elements of his previous experience of thinking outside the box and brought them into his new job at Temple Brewing, making him an invaluable resource. So welcome, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Stevens, also known as Scooter. Uh, that's your slide. I'm going to start here. <laughs> my name is John Stevens, uh, often referred to by my nickname Scooter. And I am, as uh, the start of May uh, 2015, the brand ambassador for Temple Brewing Company based in Brunswick, East Victoria. Uh, I have no formal training or education in marketing events or anything that I've worked in since I left university. And I'm not here to brag about that. I'm here to share how one thing leading to another can carry you through your employment life. Uh, if you're prepared to think differently, use your strengths and never forget what you've learned in the past and how it can be applied to your task at hand. Before I go further, I do want to clear up that uh, I do have a degree. Not that it matters, but uh, as, as a budding artist leaving high school, I presented my portfolio at the prestigious gates of the Victoria University St Albans campus and was accepted into two courses. Uh, I had a choice and I couldn't believe it at the time. After deliberating for a couple of days, I decided that it would be best to say no to the computer media arts, uh, mediated arts course and yes to the Bachelor of Arts degree in multimedia as it had more job opportunities 
um, at the end of it. So in 2003, multimedia was, well, no one really understood what multimedia was. Um, I was led to believe it was something like this, um, and that it put the world at your fingertips and connected us all. But it was pretty much like this. Uh, I got really good at Counter-Strike between classes, pretty good at Photoshop, and I got a really vague knowledge of how to use Final Cut Pro. Uh, with a bit of direction from some respected teachers, uh, I chose my subjects and my work to suit my strengths. I had no idea what I wanted to do when I was in school, and I still have no idea what I want to do, but I'm doing something. So during uni, I was right into going to these punk alternative nightclubs. Uh, mainly, th they were called Goo and Switch back in the day. It was like a Thursday and a Saturday night. Uh, and uh, it united pretty much the entire um, the alter alternative scene. By alternative, it was pretty loose back then. Like you could you could like punk and metal, and no one would bother you about it. Like it was it was a good time. So from this moment, I set foot in the first club night. I thought I thought this is grouse. Like like-minded people, punk rock, metal in a nightclub. I was stoked, and I inquired about how to, I could get more involved. Uh, that week, I signed up to be part of the promoter team, and I'm like 18 at this time, and I'm loving this. <laughs> so I spent years in the clubs, uh, in and around them, promoting and pushing my guest list so everyone would have a guest list. So mine was Scooter, and everyone would go to the club, and if you said my name, you got two bucks off, and then I got two bucks. So it was like two bucks a person. So I was like, that's, if there's 50 people, that's like a hundred bucks. I was like, that's sick. I could put fuel in my car, I could go to, I could do whatever I wanted. I could have a real nice lunch if I wanted. So I was, I was fully behind that. Uh, and I got into more and more music. I knew a few DJs by now. Uh, and they told me how easy it was to do what they did. <laughs> uh, and it's all about crowd reading and giving them a go. So I learned to DJ. Um, that was actually, I should have talked to Toby about it. That was the slide when I say I learned to DJ. And then, uh, yeah, anyway. So I learned to DJ. <laughs> um, you know, at the time, uh, MySpace was really on the rise and huge uh, in this uh, music subculture and the only real social media platform that anyone was caring about. So soon people in the clubs I was hanging out with all had a MySpace page, and then all the promoters and all the DJs I knew were promoting their clubs through these guest lists uh, uh, via MySpace, and it became this huge thing. So early adopters, as we weren't referring to them back then, uh, were just kids that got MySpace first. They got in quick and were able, and they were able to reach further out into the city uh, to kids that didn't live in the city that were into the same sort of stuff. Uh, so we had kids coming in from like Traralgon and Bendigo and Ballarat and they're all getting V-lines in to go to these punk nightclubs. Um, and it just got bigger and bigger and it got really, started really opening up doors for everybody that was promoting. So I started using the basic Photoshop skills that I'd learned at uni to make funny images to use to promote myself and my involvement in these clubs. Current jokes, things that were in and cool uh, within the scene became huge and uh, exciting ways to promote yourself and your list. Uh, uh, who was doing better, who was doing the best, was often a discussion between us promoters. Uh, none of this is out of jealousy or popularity, but as a measure of against how big the promotional network was, um, more friends equals more people using your list, equals more money for you to pick up the following week. So this is where promotions and marketing, even though at the time I didn't realise it started to really make sense. Uh, my guest list started growing and being a real earner, uh, and my name started getting around uh, and one night, the owner of the company that hosted the clubs, a uh, company's called Destroy All Lines, uh, was out in the club uh, and he asked me what I was doing with myself for work. Uh, there was a junior marketing position opening up within his company and then I should apply for it. I was like, marketing? Yeah, whatever. Like, <laughs> not connecting that what I was doing in the clubs, but my guess this was exactly what he needed. Uh, I had no idea what could have possibly meant. We'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, what, he could, what he could possibly mean, but it sounded like a good job. He explained... Uh, if he explained and asked, like, uh, he asked me, are you good at online stuff? Which at the time meant could code basic HTML and post fancy MySpace bulletins. So I was like, fuck yeah, I'm great at that. Like, I can do that. I do that all day. I went to the interview. <laughs> I got to the job and my multimedia experience was about to get a workout. <coughs> that was pretty much uh, the first couple of weeks. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on. Um, you know, the umbrella company that I worked for was called The Staple Group, uh, and it was a multi-arm company. It was a publicity arm, a distribution arm, a marketing arm, a record label, a touring division, and it ran events in the form of these punk alternative nightclubs next in Bang, uh, under the Destroyer Lines arm. Uh, my job was marketing coordinator, and that basically covered everything from driving a van with a billboard on it, 
to um, handing out uh, or to arming thousands of kids across Australia with promotional materials to spread around their friendship networks in schools. We did left of centre things like peer-to-peer -peer distribution, which was a fancy way of saying handing out flyers at gigs, and street presence elevation, I mean chalk stencils and posters. Uh, so all jobs and tasks that I saw as massively important to reaching people my age at the time that weren't getting executed by big companies uh, and labels that wanted to reach kids like me. Uh, it was extremely daunting at first, but after learning the basic lingo and understanding that, thing, uh, that these things that people are just saying are just fancy <laughs> words to describe a lot of the stuff I was doing at my guest list. Uh, so once we got ahead around that, we started executing some really fun and out there ideas. Uh, we referred to it as guerrilla marketing. Uh, it was, I was also a street team leader. I sent weekly street team emails to street teams that formed around campaigns that were most interested. I think I should have left one street team out there. Uh, kids would promote bands, uh, products, record labels, whatever else was relevant, and they would send me screenshots of their reposting of photos of themselves and their friends running the stickers that I sent them around to schools. Um, so heaps of kids, man, heaps of photos and uh, screenshots like MySpace bulletins and stuff like that. Uh, did everyone have MySpace? I'm not just talking in the dark, right? Like that was a massive thing for a really long time. <laughs> Sick. Okay, cool. Uh, so <laughs> uh, at the end of the campaigns, the kids who worked the hardest uh, and sent us the most proof of their efforts won the prize of that campaign. So there was signed posters, uh, albums, uh, skateboards, meet and greets. Uh, my focus was getting the best results out of the kids on the street team. Uh, recruit new members, report back as best as I could, and at the time, we were the only real people doing this, the only real company that was taking this level of marketing on that I was aware of. I was also getting drunk in nightclubs two nights a week, so it was a different story then. Uh, so we handled a lot of different clients and companies, from British India to Megadeth to Vanessa Amorosi's album launch campaign to Mike and Ike's Jelly Beans to taking over the Veronica's Twitter to teach them how to use it. Uh, to <laughs> to handwritten chalk campaigns for tattersalls that had to be done exclusively between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. through the night and in front of every 7-Eleven from South Bank to Latrobe Street to push the fact that 7-Eleven was now selling lottery tickets and there was a draw to celebrate it. So always trying new angles and always giving the client what they wanted, uh, whether it be a way to reach young, passionate teenagers that was actually working or a disposable way of advertising in extremely targeted fashion uh, in a very short frame. Uh, the key was basically saying yes, uh, accepting the work, followed by an intense couple of days structuring a campaign and projecting what we could deliver as proof for the work that we were doing. Uh, more often than not, backwards engineering campaigns, trying to find people to complete the work that we've promised that we'd complete, or at the very least rolling up our sleeves and getting the work done. Like I spent, I spent a couple of weeks on a train platform at Flinders Street Station because nobody would hand out these flyers at 2 p.m. So we had to get it done and we had to get the photos. So it was just, we just got shit done. Like we said we were going to, it went bled into what we would earn for the campaign, but we had to keep a consistent level of reporting so that people knew that we weren't just throwing their flyers down the drains like the kid doing the newspaper round. Um, so whilst I love what I was doing, I'd been there for a couple of years and I wanted to move on from street teams to get more involved in the nightclubs that I was into. Excuse me. A position opened and I started as the host team manager and night runner. The team that I had been a part of for so long and the clubs that I was partying at every week, I was now getting in charge of. Uh, I have a position. I was stoked uh, and, and I started really sinking my teeth into marketing the clubs as great as they could be and pushing the confines of the punk alternative banner to reach everyone that would want to party with us. I began planning events and before I knew it, we were putting beer pong comps into nightclubs, handing out cheeseburgers to wasted teens up in the club, uh, <laughs> heading out to uni open days, sending out marquees and handing out free fairy floss and popcorn to uh, new students and wording them up on the parties that they could be partying at. Uh, inviting Ghetto Santa and his milk crate thrown into the clubs at Christmas for professional photos that were online the following day for kids to use as a Christmas photo to mum. Uh, building the biggest Halloween party that Melbourne still sees every year, uh, October 31st, under the plastic banner. Uh, clearing out massive spaces and inflating jumping classes inside nightclubs. And lastly, my pièce de résistance, installing an adult-sized water wall ball pit inside a nightclub. So <laughs> that all led me to somehow a career in beer. Uh, after years and years of running events and burning the candle at both ends, I decided that I had to change it up and move on. I quit, not knowing what may come, and after all, I had a guest list, and I was a freaking DJ, bro. Uh, I, could do <laughs> I could support myself without the confines of a 9 to 5, which was false, as we're all aware, invoices don't always get paid by your stipulated payment terms. 
and often you can get left high and dry for a while. So I look for work. Uh, a friend of mine that I'd work with at Staple was now working at a brewery, and in conversation he mentioned that he might be able to put in a good word for me and potentially get me a job. At the time, I was working in a cafe, I wasn't really looking for anything serious, and I didn't want to get too locked into anything. I'm in a band as well, so I've got a few lofty goals of my own. So I was like, yeah, I could work there as long as it doesn't get in the way. Uh, and that, that was two years ago. So, <laughs> uh, so I started work at Temple. Um, I started with a few days in the brewery, bottling, packaging, cleaning kegs, and uh, working in the front of house bar. So I never considered this career in beer. And as I worked, I realized that we weren't selling that much beer. And the venue was pretty quiet. So for those that have never heard of Temple Brewing Company, Brunswick Geese is just a flag on street. It's a full functioning microbrewery with a bar and restaurant in the front, beer garden in front of that. So we took over our car park, put down a little deck. It's really tidy. You should check it out sometime. Um, but the venue was producing so much good stuff and we just weren't seeing people in the doors. So why? They had a guy doing the marketing and promotions. Uh, and what wasn't happening there? And this is while I'm cleaning a keg, I'm just thinking of this shit. Um, so <laughs> why wasn't the page promoting random and fun stuff that the brewery was doing the way that I would have promoted an event in the nightclubs? Basically, I was thinking about what I knew and what I had done in the past that spoke to young party kids, but not necessarily what could or could work for the brewery. Uh, the marketing guy left to work in a design agency, and after I suggested a few ways to grow our exposure and presence, I once again, once again found myself with the, are you good at online stuff scenario? <laughs> To which I always reply, fuck yeah, I'm <laughs> really good at it. <laughs> so it's been almost two years working for Temple. Um, coming on as a marketing and events guy uh, to a brief stint as a made-up role as a communications manager <laughs> to now my new role as brand ambassador. And before long, I tasked myself with uh, identifying what was lacking about Temple's online and real-world presence. And after much analysis, uh, it was a little bit of everything. Our online profile was weak. Uh, barely any likes on Facebook, no interaction when posts were being made. Um, I should have probably listened to you, bro. Like, Facebook sucks. <laughs> it sucks so bad. It's so hard to market through Facebook. Don't listen to anyone. <laughs> Unless you've got money, don't use Facebook. <laughs> um, so, um, there wasn't much of drive uh, or a want to know more after we'd engaged with people. So, we had an awesome range of beer, diverse, true to style, fresh, crisp, delicious. Um, paired with a venue that is serving up amazing refined comfort food, but no one knew about it and no one would know if things weren't going to change. So we spent a lot of time figuring out how to tell craft beer geeks and everyone and anyone in Melbourne about Temple. We focused on, uh, we focused our attention on growing the brewery online uh, profile, similarly to how previous my previous teams would grow the online profile of the nightclubs. Uh, as I'd done in previous projects and overhauls, we injected the personality of the staff and the brewery into our social media, and we started to see more and more growth in our online presence, which is now leading us to more exposure in the brand and our venue. Uh, the brand in our venue, sorry, the full stop's in the wrong spot, my bad. Um, so we have a beer, we have a beer called Bicycle Beer. It's a 4.2% summer ale. It's golden, it's delicious. It's, it's really light enough to get you back on the bike is a little tagline. Uh, but cyclists really love it. Like cyclists, cyclists love it. Um, <laughs> Um, it's, it, there's something special about the beer. It, it's brewed with a little bit of sea salt. I know I'm trying to make it sound fancy, but it is. Not many beers, like two beers in the world are brewed with sea salt. So you can't taste the sea salt. It's just got a really mild malt character and it just elevates it. It's a really sessionable ale. So sessionable is also a made up phrase that beer people use. It means you can drink heaps of it without getting too fucked up. <laughs> <coughs> so this is a 4.2% golden ale. Um, cyclists really enjoy it uh, because it really, it doesn't really bloat you a lot. Like it's, it's a really sick beer to drink a lot of. <laughs> so uh, we had the opportunity to align ourselves with uh, cyclists by sponsoring the famous Melbourne Roubaix last year. So if no one knows what the Roubaix, Melbourne Roubaix is based on a checkpoint race uh, similar to the Paris Roubaix. Uh, the Paris Roubaix is hectic. It's all crazy cobblestone roads and Melbourne has a lot of those. So the race is from Hawthorne to Brunswick and it finishes in the Belladrome. The brewery is a checkpoint in this race. You ride your bike into the brewery, you can park, you can get a beer, refuel. Uh, this year we're doing something fun. We're going to be win your weight in beer. So uh, you, there'll be a scale, there'll be a bit of hashtag and an at and Temple Brewing and Fixo, uh, our, our, sp our co-sponsor. Uh, and yeah, we're really excited about it and to keep going again. So since then we're working on strengthening similar relations 
strengthening similar relationships, aligning ourselves with the cycling community by hosting the right Paris, uh, the right events at Temple through uh, throughout the year, like Tour de France, Paris Roubaix, um, and we host a lot of the different like little mixes that they have. Uh, getting involved as a sponsor for the Melbourne Bike Scene, the Melbourne Whip, and being a major sponsor for the Courier Messenger World Championship when it was held in Melbourne at the Docklands about six weeks ago. Uh, taking it to the next step by partnering up with respected bike builders, Chipelli Cycles, you know, a small store in Cremorne, uh, one in Sydney and one in Queensland, and we're giving away bikes in bottle shops. So that's a really sweet bike. That thing costs $469, and all you need to do is buy a six-pack of bicycle beer to get yourself in the running. You also get that badass T-shirt up there if you win. So this has just recently been drawn everywhere. It was super successful across the country. It gave... Um, normally it's a chance to try a beer, a craft beer, uh, without being intimidated by it. There was a sick prize at the end of the rainbow. So um, the people that I, I called everyone myself that won, it was 19 bottle shops across Australia, 19 bikes. So each shop had their own bike. So it was like you pick it back up after you saw it. It was a real good closing uh, closing ceremony for them, I guess. Um, and everyone was super stoked. We, we couldn't have been happier with it. So that's not the first time we did that with Reed, uh, with some Reed bikes earlier that we bought ourselves. Also great results. So this thing is working. So I'm now going to try and work on this and grow it. Um, Chapelli's and Temple looking at doing some collaborative merchandising together. Throwing back on something you said earlier. We should talk. Uh, but now I get to communicate the brand message, the look, the feel, and the product itself to our customers and supporters and express to them in the language that I believe works best that Temple beers are sick. Uh, and they are, like you're drinking them right now, we sponsor Redbubble events, so if anyone asks you, they're sick. Um, <laughs> and I'm stoked, I'm stoked to be doing what I'm doing and I'm stoked to be able to apply the DIY guerrilla pr marketing principles that made the promotional procedures that I use for my guest list and nightclubs stand out back then to the temple brand and ethos that we all live by now. So thank you very much for your time, ladies and gents. Uh, enjoy the beers. That's it. Thank you.